Good morning. Thanks for coming. I know it's early on the first day of conference, but it's so lovely to see you all and um, have a pretty full room today. Um, I have a feeling we'll have a few more folks trickling in, so if you see folks, just make space in your aisle. Um, just want to welcome you all to the session, Building Resilience Through Organic Farming Systems. Uh, this is a session hosted by the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and we're really happy to be here today. Um, just a reminder for those of you who have cell phones with you to, to silence them for the session. And um, please know that certified crop advisor uh, credits are available for the session, so make sure to sign the sheet at the back of the room so you can get credits if you're looking for them. Um, and also on your chairs, you will find a short, super short survey. Um, and we really, really, really want to strongly encourage everybody to fill it out, especially if you are a farmer in this room. Um, it just helps us understand who's accessing this information and what more we can do to provide information to, to growers attending this and other sessions going forward. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Breeze Tenser, the Executive Director of the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and we're really honored to be partnering with the Organic Grower Summit again today. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization working nationally and somewhat across North America, Canada, and Mexico as well to support the improvement and widespread adoption of organic farming systems. And we are really here to serve the farming community and help ensure growers um, across North America are successful. Uh, we work in three primary areas, uh, research, education, and advocacy. And I'll just mention real quickly, our research program is a grant-making program. We fund on-farm research um, trials to support growers addressing practical challenges. We also do educational work, both for growers and for ag service providers. Um, all of our resources are free. Uh, we work uh, as a public interest, and so we, we try to listen to the needs identified pr by producers and provide as many educational resources as we can. We are national, so most of our resources are online, publications, courses, webinars, etc. We're not doing the um, direct field work, but we really um, appreciate getting our resources out to those who are, and we do advocacy. So again, as we get feedback from organic producers, translating those needs and challenges to policymakers, particularly at the federal level, and making sure programs, public universities, Department of Agriculture programs and services work for the organic sector. Um, I just want to bring up this one slide as an example of, um, it's hard to see, but we have a series of publications, and I, I mentioned this because it's sort of relevant to the topic at hand today of building resilience. Um, this is an issue we've heard about from growers across the country year after year, and one of the ways we've responded is by saying, hey, we know soil health is a big part of this question, this challenge, um, and there's so much science and so much research on this topic, but it's not always in a format that's super usable and accessible to growers. So our team has been sorting through that research, doing those reviews, and trying to summarize it in key uh, ways that might be more usable and accessible to growers. So we have nine different publications that are available on our website or hard copy free of charge um, on different aspects of soil health such as practical conservation tillage or soil health management for um, water holding capacity or um, soil borne diseases, other topics. So if any of those are of interest, definitely um, check them out, reach out, um, go to our website. Um, the last a uh, thing I want to note uh, in relation to today's session, um, and again, I said this at the beginning, but our goal is to get as much information as we can from growers across the country, and then to use that information to inform not only our, but the policy objectives of universities, extension agents, um, and others to make sure those farmer needs are being addressed. So we just completed our seventh national survey of certified organic and transitioning producers. Um, we had input um, from over a thousand uh, producers across the country. In addition, we did 16 focus groups with farmers all over the country to really understand what's what's happening on their farms and what some of those challenges and op obstacles are. Um, not surprisingly, the the challenges are extremely diverse, um, to based on region and parts of the country, but certainly. Um, issues relating to resiliency in today's topic were common threads that came up again and again. Um, 
both in emerging pest and disease, soil challenges, uh, water, whether too much or too little, and so forth. Um, I'm just gonna leave it at that, but just say we're publishing the results of that survey. Um, it, we'll be seeing them probably sometime in the middle of January, um, and definitely invite any of you to, to take a look, and if you have input on any of those uh, challenges that we heard or more nuanced, we welcome learning about those as well. Um, we also, in partnership with um, some of our California partners um, at UC, um, had the opportunity to dig in a little deeper to what some of the California respondents said. Um, again, this has not been published, but we will see that within the next couple of weeks, so it's just a sneak peek, but uh, we, we did hear from uh, 144 growers in California who put a lot of time and energy into giving us very detailed information about their experience and challenges, and um, there is a lot of data there, but I would say for me what stood out, three emerging trends, which since I see so many farmers in the room, is not going to be surprising to any of you, uh, but labor was the top thing we heard again and again, um, both availability, um, access to skilled labor, um, and interestingly, we particularly heard from small and medium-sized growers their concern and stress about um, labor issues. Um, production cost was a trend that came up again and again, and how to really recoup um, the cost of production in, in the sales and value of their products and some growers just feeling concerned about the prices of um, imported products and how to compete and how to really make sure their operations are at the end of the day profitable, which um, you know certainly is key to the viability of the organic operations. And then last but not least, because it relates to resiliency in today's topic, uh, we heard a lot, lot, lot about water issues, both the cost, the access, future availability, and um, soil health questions. So um, I'm saying this mostly just to set the stage for today's topic where we're gonna hear um, from some really excellent speakers, long time um, ally of ours working to advance soil health for resiliency um, and doing some really good work to serve um, all of the, um, the growers here in California. And with that, I'm really excited to introduce our speakers. Um, I'm gonna introduce them all three at once. We're gonna hear from three speakers and just note we're gonna have questions for all of them at the end. So be thinking about your questions because we have plenty of time built in for that. Uh, first, we have my colleague, Joji Marmoto, um, who's with the Cooperative Extension at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's a soil scientist. And um, I'm really excited. He's the first dedicated specialist for organic production at the UC system um, and is so, so knowledgeable. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, we also have the benefit of my friend Tom Wiley here, who is a very, very experienced organic farmer. Um, with him and his wife, Denise, operating T&D Wiley Farms uh, from 1981 to 2016, growing 75 acres of diverse vegetable production. But Tom has been a leader in so many um, organizations, nonprofits, other efforts across the state to advance organic farming, and is most recently working with a few organic farmers to advance um, no-till organic vegetable production. Um, so some really exciting work. And last but not least, you might see an empty seat, but uh, we are joined today virtually uh, by another longtime ally, Eric Brennan, who um, has been working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Research Service here in Salinas, California. He is the first and still only dedicated organic researcher at the Ag Research Service uh, in the entire United States and does amazing uh, work there, really um, advancing organic systems and climate smart agriculture, um, doing work in cover cropping, um, weed management, fertility, and um, biological control for, for pests, um, and some great work. Eric is not able to be here in person today, but is joining us virtually, and we do have both a talk, and he will be joining us for some live Q&A at the end, so uh, welcome, Eric, also. And with that, Joji. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here. My name is Joji Muramoto. I am a soil scientist, agroecologist, I thank OFRF for giving me this opportunity to study and talk about climate change and pest management in California organic production systems. This is not a subject I study regularly, but given its importance, I decided to challenge myself and prepare this talk. As I prepared this talk, however, 
I quickly realized that it is impossible to cover impacts of climate change on all of extremely diverse California organic systems in 12 minutes. So today, uh, I'll give you a quick and dirty summary of general impacts of climate change on California organic farming systems, focusing on pest and disease management. If you have any questions, feel free to ask, but I might not have all answers. I'll show you all references I cited in this talk on the last slide so that you can see de deeper. <clears throat> Here's the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to summarize climate change trends and their impact, uh, expected impacts on agriculture in California. Second, climate change impacts on arthropod pests and plant diseases in California agriculture, focusing on organic systems. Finally, available strategies in pest and disease management in California organic production systems in adapting to climate change. Okay, let's start it. <clears throat> so let's start with climate change trends in California. As you know, the average annual temperature has risen by two degrees Fahrenheit since the early 20th century. According to multiple climate models, by the end of this century, depending on the emission level, high or low, temperature is projected to increase three to eight degrees Fahrenheit. Heat waves will increase in frequency and intensity. Snowpack will decline up to 60%. Number of severe drought and flooding will increase 50%. Such climate change will have considerable impact on California agriculture. First, winter chill hours for many fruits and nut trees will decline. As a result, apricot, kiwi fruit, peach, nectarine, plum, and walnut becomes less suitable in the Central Valley. Second, reduced water availability due to greater evapotranspiration and reduced snowpack with no anticipated precipitation increase will decrease water supplies and use of irrigation. More stringent groundwater regulation is expected, as you have been experiencing already. Third, yield reduction due to higher respiration rate caused by higher nighttime temperatures and summer heat waves is expected. Not just yield, but reduced quality, especially of fruits, is also expected. Fruit size may be smaller, fruits may become softer, and vitamin contents may decrease. This map integrated biophysical and socioeconomic indicators showing agricultural vulnerability index, AVI, across California. The redder the color, the more vulnerable to climate change. As you see, Salinas Valley, Pajaro Valley, and San Joaquin Valley are identified as the most vulnerable regions in the state. We all need to continue our efforts to mitigate climate change, but in agriculture, adaptation to climate change is also necessary. Now, talk about pests and diseases. Unfortunately, climate change will mostly exacerbate arthropod pests and plant diseases in California and many other parts of the world. Both arthropod and pathogens are particularly sensitive to temperature. Therefore, climate change will increase northward and high elevation gradient mi mi migration of pests, pathogen survival in winter, earlier spore release, new diseases, invasive species introductions, and arthropod developmental rates and oviposition. Climate change will decrease effectiveness of arthropod biocontrol by fungi, which is concerning for organic growers, and, and I'm going to talk about it more in, minute, in a minute. Also, arthropod diversity in ecosystems. Soybean disease, diseases relevant to California are also mostly expected, expected to increase. Fusarium moxisporum, Macrophomina fasciolina, Sclerotinia minor and Sclerotinia sclerotirum. In this table, Rhizoctonia uh, solani is the only one that may decrease. Organic growers use biocontrol. How does climate change affect that? Uh, warmer temperature within natural enemies thermal range will increase its activity, leading to increasingly successful biocontrol, which is good news. However, the temperature effect may differ among species 
and it may uncouple a par parasitoid from its host. Spiders are most susceptible to drought than any other arthropod species. And effect of biopesticides can be increased up to a threshold temperature, but heat waves exceeding the threshold can reduce its efficacy. Evidence suggests that organic systems can have less soybean diseases due to improved soy health. This phenomenon is called soy suppressiveness, and there are general suppressiveness and specific suppressiveness. I'm now going to go to details here, but soy plant microbiome's complex relationships are exciting and active area of research. But how does climate change affect soy suppressiveness? This is an important question for organic growers. Here's a summary of a review examining climate change effect on soil's pathogen suppressiveness. Green means positive change and red negative. There are more positive than negatives in this table, which is good. Uh, particularly, growth st stimulation of mycorrhizal community is an important positive. Plant growth promoting bacteria, PGPR activities will also likely to increase. Before talking about climate change adaptation strategy in organic systems, let's review characteristics of organic farming systems. First, organic production systems rely on self-regulating ecological and biological processes and interactions to sustain productivity and reduce environmental degradation. Pests and diseases are, pests and diseases are primarily prevented and managed by crop rotation, enhanced agrobiodiversity, biocontrol, resistant crop varieties, soil health, organic amendment, and limited biological and chemical intervention. Those photos are local examples of currently practiced approaches, such as hedge, uh, alfalfa uh, trap crop, cover crop, and hedgerow, and uh, alyssum flower beds. Organic systems are location specific and knowledge intensive. This is very much in contrast with conventional system, which is location general and chemical intensive. Many organic growers have already adapted to the local ecosystem, which is an advantage to adapt to climate change. However, there's a concern that climate change might exceed the current adaptive capacity of some organic growers, depending on the level of pest pressure. Now, what's the adapting strategy for arthropod pest management in organic systems? Shifting planting, harvest, planting or harvesting date to avoid peak pest pressure, that's one thing. And switching or introducing new crop varieties to deter pests and encourage their natural enemies. And also diversifying farming system seems to be important. <clears throat> Genetic and speci uh, species diversity in fields and herds provide a low risk buffer in uncertain weather environments. And spatial diversity, such as intercropping, polyculture, and agroforestry may play more important role in adapting to climate change. How about disease management strategy in organic systems? This chart is from a study in the UK, but I think, I think similar strategy can be used in California. Again, increasing agrobiodiversity is a key. Strategies at both at the landscape and Landscape scape, uh, scale and field scale are shown in this chart. At the landscape scale, mosaic mixture of crops with different cultivars and different crops in different rotations, hedgerows and disease monitoring are suggested. At field scale, intercropping and crop mixture of different resistant genes, crop rotations, canopy architecture and sowing densities are suggested. Also, the inference of soy health may go far beyond soybean disease suppression. This study showed that healthy soil can improve plant resistance to insects. Scott Park is an organic grower in Northern California who is participating in the CGI project Tom is going to talk about after me. He noticed that his organic process, processing tomato fields have less leaf hopper pressure than surrounding conventional press processing tomato fields. Researchers at UC Davis found that Changes in leaf hopper settling between organically and conventionally grown tomatoes are dependent on the increased plant resistance by the salicylic acid accumulation in plants 
mediated by rhizosphere microbial communities. Again, soil health can improve plant resistance to insect pests. Who would have thought about that? We just started to understand, probably, the importance of soil health, and this will be another key as both adaptation and mitigation strategies for climate change. Given the great variation in crop types and microclimates across California, pervasive nature of damage expected by climate change, and the landscape scale strategies needed, interdisciplinary collaboration between organic growers, CPAs, researchers, and policymakers at local or regional level is extremely important. This chart was made by researchers in the EU, but it is relevant to our state and show what we need to do to adapt to climate change. In summary, climate change will have a considerable in impact on California agriculture. It will exacerbate pest and disease pressure in California. Climate change will also affect the efficacy of organic growers' pest management uh, practices such as biocontrol, biologicals, and soil suppressiveness, negative and positive. Diversification and soil health are key strategies to create pest resi resilient organic farming systems under climate change. Many organic growers have already converted from external input driven management to adaptive management. This is an advan advantage to adapt to climate change. However, there is a, a concern that climate change might exceed the current adaptive capacity of organic growers. Local interdisciplinary cooperation will be necessary to create climate and pest resilient organic production systems. Uh, this is the last slide and these are the references I used in this presentation. Feel free to take a photo. If you want to have a copy of specific reference, please let me know. I'd, I'd be happy to send it to you. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. So several years back, uh, I wound up a 40-some year production career in San Joaquin Valley row crop agriculture, 35 as T&D Willie Farms, a 75-acre certified organic intensive vegetable operation employing 50 full-time year-round employees. We actually made money doing it. In retirement, I've had the privilege to engage with a group of legacy organic farmers, UC Extension, and Chico State's Regenerative Institute in on-farm research into no-till and reduced-till organic vegetable systems. As philosophically driven early adoption organic farmers, we were soil huggers and microbe worshipers from day one convinced that compost, cover crops, the elimination of toxic and synthetic inputs, plus a good dose of tillage would transform our farms into horns of plenty. Well, it did, though the road was rough and the learning curve steep. Decades on, organic farmers surprisingly found themselves targets of criticism from Midwest no-tillers and an emerging regenerative agriculture movement for our excessive reliance on tillage. 40 years ago, we knew little about the soil life that we worshiped beyond visible earthworms, which seemed to disappear the more we tilled. Only about 1% of soil organisms can be cultured in a laboratory petri dish, so when the ongoing Metagenomics revolution hit soil science, a technology that characterizes the collective genome of all microorganisms from an environmental sample. We learned that a handful of soil can host 10,000 to 1 million unique bacterial species, while several meters of fungal hyphae representing hundreds of species, can interlace a single gram of soil. To be sure, few of these are named or explored as to the functions they might perform in the maintenance of healthy, productive soil plant ecosystems, the biodiversity of which is estimated 
to surpass that of any known environment on Earth. Jerry Hatfield, director of USDA's National Soil Tilth Laboratory, calculates that the combined biomass weight of countless individual microbes in an acre of soil equals that of two adult elephants, totaling 10,000 pounds. Continuing revelations of biology's complexity and scale underfoot caused a handful of us organic farmers to question the violent physical disturbance that our tillage practices were visiting on the subterranean architecture that microbial communities construct to benefit themselves and the plant communities with which they exchange services for energy. Our tillage events regularly destroyed their village, after which we expected them to rebuild, reflecting on after which we expected them to rebuild. Reflecting on physician's Hippocratic oath, first do no harm, several of us individually set out to experiment with no-till approaches, assisted by UC's Jeff Mitchell, who's been tirelessly promoting no-till adoption in the Central Valley's conventional row crop community for some 30 years. Jeff got his hands on a Rodale roller crimper device designed as a mechanical herbicide substitute for terminating a cover crop in organic systems. Early individual on-farm efforts were mostly exercises in frustration, which led to the formation of our collaborative effort in late 2018 in the belief that sharing success and failure amongst a learning community would overcome discouragement and take us farther and faster. The roller crimper has not proven as effective on California farms as it has been out east. We struggle particularly with grains popping back up after multiple crimpings, even when broadleaves in the same cover crop mixes are effectively killed with one pass. The roller crimper approach is favored if season-long residue cover is desired when weed suppression, water infiltration, and soil temperature reduction are the paramount goals. Our three cooperating farms, which range from 300 acres to just under 2,000, were primarily motivated by desires to build soil organic matter and to increase fungal to bacterial ratios in our soils. Row crop systems under tillage are bacterially dominant, as filamentous fungal hyphae are continuously sliced and diced by physical soil, soil disturbance. Symbiotic mycorrhizal associations are especially prized for their ability to deliver moisture and nutrients particularly phosphorus, to plants in exchange for sugars exuded through roots. The interconnection of root systems in plant communities by these fungi has been shown to act as a below-ground telegraph system by which plants under insect or pathogen attack can forewarn their neighbors to prepare defensive phytochemical immune responses. Jeff Mitchell completed comprehensive baseline soil testing to one meter depth on our farm plots in December of 2018. And we set out on a three-year odyssey in pursuit of our goals by adhering as much as possible to five increasingly familiar soil health commandments. We armor soil by always maintaining living plant cover or residue on the soil surface. We minimize soil disturbance by abandoning the disc and chisel for shallow cultivation 
for shallow cultivation only when and where necessary. We increase plant diversity by rotations, which include cover crops of up to one dozen species. We, main continue, we maintain continuous live plants, roots, for as many weeks of the year as possible, intensifying photosynthesis to input maximum energy into our soil battery. We employ livestock integration, if and when possible, to elevate soil carbon and function through the catalytic effect of ruminant grazing, an influence which factored in the evolution of the formerly grassland valley soils that we all firm. This fifth commandment is the toughest one for California fresh produce farmers to swallow, especially if major big box retail grocery buyers unnecessarily discourage compost use in organic production systems. Peer-reviewed science demonstrates that organically managed soils using compost, animal, and green manures are associated with lower risks of human pathogen survival in soil. Two of the three farms in our research group employ sheep in rotational grazing and regularly obtain food safety certifications while doing so. In addition to expected challenges of cover crop termination and weed control, our no-till experiments over three years have experienced a less expected shift in nutrient mineralization which results in yield drags of 10 to 20%. Most successful no-till is practiced in regions where crops are rain-fed and relatively humid throughout the growing season. Humidity encourages the biodegradation, the biodegradation of residues left atop the soil surface, while rainfall moves mineralized nutrients from same into soil and the crop root zone. In California's semi-arid Mediterranean summer growing environment, plant residues and fertility inputs, such as compost, left high and dry on the soil surface, don't readily decompose, contributing less immediate nutrition to the growing crop. One of our experimenters has reduced yield drag by sprinkle irrigating a crop from start to finish. But more data needs to be collected on this approach, and not all crops can be irrigated by this method. Another approach, employing plasticulture, was demonstrated in 2020 with no-till watermelons on Phil Foster's San Juan Bautista farm. Our hypothesis was that a flail, a flail chopped cover crop and compost left atop drip irrigated beds and covered with plastic mulch would decompose rapidly, mineralizing nutrients for the watermelons growing through it. It did so, roughly doubling the yields of adjacent, doubling the yields of adjacent beds treated similarly but without plastic mulch, and equaling or exceeding this farm's historical watermelon yields under tillage. Encouraged by these results, we launched a full-scale 2021 trial adding full tillage with and without plastic mulch treatments to the no-till with and without mulch treatments, replicating each treatment four times. All treatments grew a multi-species overwintered cover crop on 80-inch beds that exceeded 10,000 pounds of dry biomass per acre before termination, the nitrogen content of which calculated to some 300 pounds per acre. Secretariat seedless watermelon was transplanted on May 25th and harvested over six pickings between August 18th and October 14th. 
Replicated yield results show a strong advantage for plasticulture in both the no-till and the tilled systems. We were encouraged to see that no-till with plastic outperformed tilled no plastic, the farm's historical production method. So what we were particularly excited to see is that um, in these two uh, treatments here, all of our four replications came in very close to each other. Here around 20,000 pounds, very low, the no-till, no plastic. Up here also a great deal of agreement between the four replications of the no-till plus plastic and the no-tilled without, in the tilled without plastic, um, we pretty much had very even uh, neck and neck with the no-till plus plastic. And this is the traditional uh, production system on Phil's farm for watermelons as he's been growing for many, many years. And uh, somewhere around 55,000 pounds is what his historical average is. Over here with tillage, full tillage plus plastic, bingo, we, we go up to uh, above 60,000. One of the reps at 80, we got a little bit of disparity here between uh, a little let more disparity here between the replications. But uh, all in all, um, my statistician, Eric Brennan, who's going to be our next up, uh, tells us that we've got very solid results here. Very solid results here. So we're, uh, we're, we're encouraged. Um, the uh, the no-till with plastic last year, if you remember the previous slide, uh, it was up here in the, the 75,000 range on one of the trials. So um, anyhow. The world is uh, understandably uh, coming down on plastics for environmental concerns. And we would like to find a more acceptable approach that performs equally. We will begin experimentation with biodegradable plastic mulches in 2022. Our three farm cooperators have been practicing exemplary soil husbandry for over three decades, resulting in soils that measure from two and a half to 5% soil organic matter. We learned from several expert tutorials that a 2% organic matter soil harbors some 5,000 pounds of organic nitrogen per acre within that once living material. Tillage aerates, enhancing soil oxygen that stimulates microbes to consume organic matter, mineralizing nitrogen for plant uptake. Typical Midwestern corn crops have been isotopically proven, isotopically proven to favor nitrogen from organic matter two to one over synthetic nitrogen inputs. Just how, without tillage, can we stimulate that organic system to share more nutrients with demanding crops? Our collaborative will explore several novel approaches over the coming year. Climate disruption challenges agriculture to adopt greater reliance on natural systems versus concentrated inputs that emit larger amounts of greenhouse gases through manufacture and use. It is of paramount importance that we develop high carbon soils with enhanced water holding capacity and active microbial communities to buffer increased crop stress. If you are interested in joining a learning community, please attend our collaborative's full day EcoFarm pre-conference on organic no-till systems, January 19th at Pacific Grove's Asilomar Conference Grounds. We welcome your engagement and input. Thank you. Hey there, my friends over at the Organic Grower Summit. I'm sorry I can't be there in person with you, but guess what? We figured it out. Because of the COVID restriction, I can't be there. 
but um, I like making videos so I made a video for you and that's what you're gonna see right after this just a little brief introduction in that video you'll see me referring to links in the video description now that's because the video that you will see will be on YouTube uh, probably within a week or so so you can go and check it out on my YouTube channel if you just type in Brennan Organic USDA on YouTube, you should be able to find me. So, sorry I can't be there, but hopefully this video helps. Uh, I will be there for the panel discussion via Zoom. So, uh, thanks for letting me participate. And if you're ever in Salinas, come check out our research here. So, take care, and I hope you enjoy your summit. I'm going to be talking about cover cropping strategies for climate smart farms. And I'll focus on cover crops because I think they're an essential part of sustainable vegetable production. Here's a paper I wrote about this that you might want to check out. There's a link to it in the video description along with links to other articles and videos you might find interesting. And there's also a clickable table of contents in the video description to the different parts of this video. But I want to start off with a joke from a very thought-provoking article by a reporter who had been at the climate summit in Glasgow. The joke goes like this. Two planets are talking to each other. One looks like this beautiful blue marble and the other looks like this dusty brown ball. What on earth happened to you? The beautiful planet asks the brown one. I had homo sapiens, answers the brown planet. Don't worry, says the blue planet. They don't last long. Now it's true that in Earth's geological time, that's shown here as a spiral, we humans, Homo sapiens, haven't been around long. We evolved during the Pleistocene. And we didn't invent agriculture until about 10,000 years ago, during the Holocene, when the temperatures on Earth were relatively stable. Here's a graph that shows the temperature variability during the past 100,000 years, with lots of stability during the Holocene, when agriculture was developed. Now, as we change our planet's climate, we don't know if our farms will be able to feed us. And that's why it's critical that we work together to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions that are changing our planet's climate and threatening our survival. Here's a really good video that I think did a good job of explaining this risk. And here's another one that really helped me to understand climate resilient farms. Now, one image that comes to my mind when I think of climate resilient agriculture is the little tin canoe that I made when I was growing up in Papua New Guinea. I loved paddling my little canoe out to a small island where I'd fish and explore. I'd go out there in the early morning when the water was calm and glassy. But I knew that in the afternoon, I needed to be careful to paddle back to the main island before the wind got too strong and the big waves could easily sink my little tin canoe. The weather was predictable, just like it's been on Earth for the past 10,000 years. But if the weather hadn't been predictable, what could I have done to make my little canoe more stable and resilient? Well, I could have added a wooden outrigger or two to prevent it from tipping over. And to increase my efficiency of getting places, I could have added a mast and a sail. Now in my mind, these modifications to my little canoe can symbolize what farmers will need to do to develop creative solutions to add shock absorbers to their farms to make them more resilient and efficient and therefore more likely to stay afloat and adapt to the challenges of climate change. Okay, now for the cover cropping strategies for climate smart farmers. I'm gonna focus on the central coast of California where I've been doing lots of cover cropping research for the past 20 years. It's a part of California that's extremely vulnerable to climate change, but the future of cover crops here is bright, and that's because of a new regulation that's focused on reducing nitrate leaching into our groundwater. This regulation gives farmers a major incentive for winter cover cropping. This is great, but I can also see three climate change related challenges with increased cover cropping. The first one has to do with water use by the cover crops. So cover crops provide all kinds of ecosystems services, but they also use water. And depending on how they're managed, they could actually reduce groundwater recharge, which wouldn't be good. If you want to learn more about this complex issue, check out this paper. 
The second issue is that as the climate warms, the production of some cool season vegetables might have to shift from the summer because it's too hot into the increasingly mild winter. And this could leave less fallow land available for winter cover cropping. And the third potential challenge has to do with the availability of cover crop seed due to the increased demand and limited supply of that seed. I found that the seed supply of popular cover crops like rye often runs out in the fall. But this year it happened much earlier because the entire seed production of a relatively new rye variety that I helped to introduce to the area several years ago was wiped out by the heat wave that occurred in the Pacific Northwest where the rye seed was being produced. A recent analysis found that this heat wave was virtually impossible without human caused climate change. So keep these different challenges in mind as I talk about cover cropping strategies. Okay, so the first strategy is to pay close attention to your cover crops and measure them. You might wonder, how does this help you? Well, here are two ways. First, if you're a farmer in the central coast of California, this will help you to get the nitrogen credit for growing a non-legume cover crop in that new regulation that I mentioned earlier. The regulation has three requirements for cover crops. The first one is pretty easy. You just got to keep track of the planting and termination date of the cover crop. But how's a grower supposed to meet the second two requirements without a drying oven or tissue analysis? Well, don't worry. My friend Richard and I are running several trials this winter to figure out simple ways that farmers can easily meet the second two requirements. So far, our data suggests that cover crop height can be used as an estimate for biomass. And we expect that cover crop developmental stage will be a good estimate of the cover crop's carbon to nitrogen ratio. Stay tuned for more on that. Now the second reason you want to pay close attention to your cover crops is that it will actually allow you to get more benefits from them. Let me give you a very specific example. One of the main reasons we grow cover crops is to add organic matter to the soil, right? Well, after you spend all that money on seed and planting costs and irrigation, you want to make sure that you get as much organic matter as possible. So how do you know if your cover crop is still producing organic matter? Well, here's an example from a grower's field that I sampled recently. So this graph shows how the cover crop's biomass changed over time. The grower had removed the pipe from the field and told me initially that they wanted to take the cover crop down on this date. And based on the cover crop's growth stage and the cover crop's height from a few random plants, I knew that the cover crop still had a lot of potential to grow. So I suggested that they hold off a week or two before disking the cover crop. And here's the cool thing. Just by waiting one week, they increased the cover crop's biomass, the shoot biomass, by 37%. And waiting two weeks, they increased it by 50%. Pretty amazing, right? Well, guess what? Here's also what's cool. The amount of biomass in that field captured the same amount of carbon dioxide from the air above that field that would have been released by burning over 500 gallons of gasoline. If you want to see how I calculated that, check out a link in the video description. By the way, here are the three basic tools that I like to use when I measure my cover crops. A measuring tape to get the cover crop height. A lettuce knife to dig up plants in a few feet of row to measure to see how much of the seed that I planted actually emerged. We don't want to waste seed. And then a free smartphone app that you can use to take a photo of the cover crop and then instantly determine the percent ground cover of that cover crop. And that ground cover is related to the ability of the cover crop to shade out weeds. Okay, the second strategy is to be very cautious with cover crop mixtures, especially those that include legumes and cereals. Now, I've spent a lot of time in legume cereal mixtures over the past 20 years, trying to understand how the legumes compete with the cereals. Several years ago, I made a video where I questioned if legume cereal mixtures were a good fit in organic vegetable production. I hope you'll check that video out. But essentially, my long-term research with mixtures has shown that legumes don't compete well with cereals, especially when the rainfall is limited and early fall temperatures are warm. Now both of these are much more likely to happen as the climate changes in California. 
So when you're choosing cover crops, think about the drought tolerance of the cover crop. All right, now the third strategy is to try to reduce tillage as you transition from a vegetable to a cover crop. Now I know there's a lot of interest and potential benefits to reducing tillage in vegetable systems. But believe me, it's not easy, especially if you can't use an herbicide and if you're trying to plant a vegetable into a thick mat of cover crop mulch. I made a video a few years ago about some of the benefits and challenges of tillage that you might want to check out. Now one of the easiest ways that I think we can potentially reduce tillage in high value vegetable systems could be when we transition from a vegetable to a winter cover crop. This might work because in contrast to most small seeded vegetables that need a very fine seed bed to get a nice uniform stand, cover crops are pretty tough and flexible and can germinate without a lot of careful soil preparation. And you might be able to actually just mow the vegetable and leave the residue on the soil surface to conserve moisture and help to slow down the release of nitrogen as that residue decomposes. And then you could drill the cover crop right into the vegetable beds. Here's an example of where a cover crop was drilled between the rows of mowed vegetables. And in this case, the mowed vegetables regrew along with the seeded cover crop. That's okay as long as the vegetable regrowth doesn't cause a pest or disease issue. Now, if you don't want vegetable regrowth, you could mow the vegetable and then undercut it to kill it before drilling the cover crop through the mulch. Who knows, you might even be able to leave the drip tape from the previous vegetable crop on the soil surface and then use that to irrigate the cover crop. I think it's worth trying. And that leads me to my last strategy, which is to think out of the box and experiment and innovate like crazy. There are so many innovative ideas that need to be tried. I'm here to help and I love working with farmers to design simple experiments that evaluate their ideas. One of my more novel and somewhat crazy cover cropping ideas is described in this video. I'm still working on this, so stay tuned, but the cool thing about this juicing strategy from a climate change perspective is that it would allow the cover crop to scavenge nitrogen and protect groundwater while using relatively little water and producing about half as much biomass as a standard cover crop. And then the grower can just use that juice as a fertilizer for the next vegetable and the cover crop biomass or the pulp from the juicing process as a soil amendment when it's convenient. Check out that video when you get a chance. Anyways, thanks for listening and I hope you do your part to support climate smart farmers and help to protect the beautiful blue planet that we call home. We don't have a lot of time left to figure out this climate change crisis, but if we work together, we can do it. Don't forget to check out the other resources in the video description and take care. All right, well, thank you to our speakers. Um, my name is Haley, I am OFRO's Partnership and Development Manager, and we're just really happy to be here after two years. Here is Eric live, um, coming in from the Valley. Hey, Eric. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Um, awesome, so uh, a couple of housekeeping things before we move into a QA. and a I just wanna mention, um, there are a couple things on your seat. One of them is a survey, it's super quick. If you can just take it and leave it on your seat. If you don't have a pen, there's one in the back, that'd be great. And then the other flyer, flyer is Tom's um, presentation that's coming up at EcoFarm later, in, or actually early next year. All right, so Kelsey is in the back, um, has a microphone, and we're gonna just lead it to Q&A. We have about 20 or 30 minutes before we're gonna move into some discussion groups around the room. Oh, okay, I'll repeat the question because you didn't have the microphone. Uh, this gentleman is asking uh, how and why do we think that the uh, plastic increased the yields over, uh, you know, the, the, the non-mulched plots. Um, you know, I've, I've been using plastic culture in probably the last 12 years of my farming career, um, no closer to 20 probably. Um, I was very much against plastic. Uh, most of us organic farmers were. Uh, I asked people very 
respected people in the organic community, whether they thought the use of plastic mulch would make biological fertility systems work as good or better. And they all warned me against it. They said, oh no, it's going to make it worse. Uh, th you know, things won't work. Uh, it was exactly the opposite. Um, so I did it and uh, it enhanced our production tremendously. You know, I really haven't looked into research why plastic culture works so well. But certainly in the Central Coast and all over the Salinas Valley, we use the heck out of plastic mulch. And we do that because it works. Um, so in this instance, uh, with a no-till, comparing a no-till system, I think it works because it creates kind of like a Midwestern or an Eastern environment under that plastic. And it keeps that biomass moist all the time perfectly and uh, the temperature is enhanced also by the mulch. So the biodegradation of those organic uh, uh, cover crop amendments and the compost that was left on the surface, um, it really takes place at a much more rapid pace. And somehow or another, even though we're not sprinkling, it works its way into the soil and uh, the, the plant has access to it. In my system, uh, when I was growing eggplant, tomatoes, peppers with plastic mulch. At the end of the season, I could pull that plastic back and I could find feeder roots of my crop right on the surface of the soil. So if you keep that perfect moisture environment right up to the soil surface all the time, and I'm talking 24 seven, roots will actually go up there and mine that stuff right on the surface. So that's my theory as to why it works so well, but uh, it, it does work. Uh, yeah, you mentioned in your video that um, groundwater recharge is reduced in cover crop systems. Um, is that because of the increased evapotranspiration of the cover crop or because I've always heard that cover crops help with infiltration. Um, so just wondering mm -hmm. if you could expand a little bit on that. Yeah, thanks for the question. That's a good one. Um, so first off, uh, it, it depends a lot on how the the cover crop is managed. You're right in the sense that cover crops often can increase infiltration. So, you know, it's 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 not a simple uh, issue, and quite frankly, it's not been well studied. The paper that you will be able to get a link to in that video description when it comes when the video is on YouTube uh, looked at it, it was a meta analysis. So they what, what a meta analysis is is that they took. Uh, all the all the published data that they could find that met certain criteria and across the world, and they looked to see how groundwater was uh, recharge was affected by cover crops. So it covers a lot of different areas. Uh, I don't believe um, California was very well represented in that in that study, if at all. Uh, so so just uh, keep keep in mind there's a lot we need to learn on that issue. But but here here's the challenge. Um, we know that when you, you know, when you put a, a cover crop over the soil surface, it helps to s slow the, the, the energy that's hitting the, ground, the soil and therefore, can, and therefore can increase infiltration. So that's why we has le have less runoff from those fields when we have a cover crop in them. The problem though is that as that cover crop matures, as it reaches those later developmental stages, so say for a cereal rye or something like that, and it starts to you know, head out, its water use can go up pretty high. Like right now, in like my cover crops that we're irrigating today, you know, they're, they're using about 0 0.08 inches of, of water a day. That's once we got a full canopy. That's not too bad. But as the weather warms up later in the spring, uh, it'll go up quite a bit. So um, it's a balance. I, I wouldn't say that it's it's always negative or always positive. It's just something I think we have to manage carefully so that we don't have problems with it. If you don't have a cover crop there, keep in mind also that that increases runoff. And so for example, in the east side of Salinas where I do most of my research, at least our research farm is, we don't want our water running down to the Salinas River because that may help that aquifer down there, but it doesn't do a darn thing for the aquifer in our region, you know, higher up here. So. It's a complicated issue. Um, I think if we carefully manage the cover crop and not get it too big, depending on the rainfall, we can we can work with that. And that's why the juicing thing has actually become more interesting to me because when you grow a cover crop for nitrate uh, extraction from the soil, 
it only needs about half the biomass to get all the nitrogen it's going to take up. Once it takes that nitrogen up, uh, it doesn't take any more. It just dilutes that with carbon. And that's where the water use can increase. So I think this juicing idea might be a way to kind of get a win-win. Great question. Another way you can manipulate the water use of a cover crop is you can, you can do multiple mowings throughout its growing cycle. And uh, if it's getting too tall, it's, per, it's threatening to make seed of certain species that you don't want, you can go and mow a four-foot cover crop down to a foot. And sometimes it will express other species in it that weren't expressing themselves very well when they were under greater competition with the grasses. Um, so you can manipulate things uh, quite a bit that way. Phil Foster's a real pioneer in doing that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, Joji, I have a question. So I'm very interested in soil health and disease suppressive soils. So with your research and looking at disease suppressive soils, how to get to the, that point where you're measuring what microbiome you're developing to get these disease suppressive soils. And if you've got certain amendments or cover crop mixtures and, and methods to incorporate those cover crops or even mow them and leave the mulch, um, what's, what's the best way to get to that? Yeah, great question. And uh, so a lot of active research is going on. And we, we, I, I believe that at this point, we, we don't totally understand the mechanism just yet. Um, we know it's biological. Um, uh, microbes are key components of soil suppressiveness. And I, as I said, there are two types of suppressiveness, general suppressiveness and specific suppressiveness. And general suppressiveness is, is, is like uh, um, it can suppress uh, multiple diseases. Um, like generally speaking, there's a study showing organic farm tends to have more suppressive uh, less diseases compared to uh, conventional. That's general suppressiveness. And then specific suppressiveness works only for one specific pathogens and then caused by specific microbes uh, or sometimes nematodes. Uh, for example, um, there's a fungi that feed on nematodes. And then um, if we can increase those kind of fungi, we can create specific suppressive soil. But how to make that happen? Um, there are several studies uh, proposed. And one thing is to keep planting the same plant at the uh, disease uh, conducive soil again and again. Keep planting until you get the suppressiveness. Um, interesting thing is suppressive soil have found in the uh, field where wheat was continuously planting. It has a disease first, but regardless, if we keep planting wheat, disease started to disappear, which means plants actually selecting um, more beneficial microbes in the rhizosphere to suppress those pathogens. So um, there's a, uh, I can share the paper, but uh, um, recent studies, one of the approaches to develop suppressive, specific suppressed soil is to, in a pot scale, um, use that disease-infected soil and keep planting the same variety uh, of plants continuously until we get the suppressiveness and extract the microbe and apply it to others. That's one approach that I proposed, I know. Can I make a comment? Uh, there was a paper that was just published this year uh, from a group out of UC Davis, uh, who was headed by Kate Scow, where they took soils from the Century uh, Organic Project up there. Um, so they had soils that had been treated for 27 years with tillage, uh, no cover crops, and uh, conventional fertilizers. They had uh, soils that were treated with cover crops for that period of time, and soils that were treated with cover crop and compost, animal compost, chicken compost, for 27 years. They brought all these soils in the laboratory, and they contaminated, with, contaminated them with the measured amounts of listeria and um, salmonella. 
the soils that had been treated with cover crops and chicken, chicken compost for 27 years rapidly reduced the uh, contamination, the, 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 the cell count of the uh, pathogens uh, much more rapidly than any of the other uh, treatments. Uh, they found that cover crop alone did not, did, did, you know, they did reduce uh, contamination, but not as great as both cover cropped and uh, composted soils. So as Joji mentioned, there's a lot of research going on in this area right now. Um, but basically, you know, it's diversity, diversity, diversity. So the more kinds of rotations, the more uh, species mixes of cover crops that you can put in your system are going to stimulate greater numbers of species of both all the kind of soil biology that you need to uh, get after this uh, general suppressiveness of soils. It's very exciting, very exciting uh, work right now going on. It's just, just a revolution going on in what we're learning about soil microbiology. And uh, you know, 20 years from now, we'll have a lot of these more specific manipulations that we can, that we can do. So very cool stuff. <laughs> uh, I had a question uh, regarding the watermelon trial in the plastic culture with the cover crop. How long did you wait to plant after applying the plastic over the cover crop? Yeah, okay, that's an important question. Um, the stuff I had written, uh, had read about it out of Germany suggested that it was very dangerous to plant into that uh, mode cover crop under plastic uh, very shortly after having done so because uh, volatiles will come off of the uh, material and damage your transplants. So we decided that we were gonna wait at least three weeks uh, to get a certain amount of biodegradation there so that we wouldn't have that issue going on. And we did so and we had no problems. Um, however, my friends up at Full Belly Farm in Cape Hay, they uh, did a very small trial, and they mowed the cover crop, covered it with plastic, and planted their eggplant the same dang day. And they had no problems, <laughs> which amazed me. I, 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 so, um, you know, uh, go with what you want, but I, I, I do think it's a better idea to let it biodegrade for a few weeks before you, before you plant into it. But they proved me sort of wrong on that, too. I have a question in regards to the no-till philosophy. Um, when it comes to food safety, when you're growing organic uh, vegetables or things made for human consumption, when you are testing these throughout the growth season, um, if there's any bacteria or salmonella, E. coli that appear, how do you go about destroying that crop without disturbing the soil? Um, and then another question I have in regards to the no-till philosophy is, um, for, is it limited to certain crops? I'm trying to gain a better understanding of it. Um, I have customers, for instance, that go that grow uh, baby spinach, that you know takes max three to four weeks for them to grow, um, and then they're mowing it and they're dissing it back in, and they're growing that same crop three to four times in three to four week increments. Um, how would you go through a no-till philosophy without? without disking that soil back into the ground or the what's left of the plant back into the ground, um, is, that, is that advantageous or is it limited to certain crops? I'm gonna have to apologize, my hearing is not very good. I drove tractor without earplugs for too many years. Um, but I'll try to see if I understand. Um, you were talking about the, the pathogens in soil or the pathogens in the compost possibly that you were Okay. I, just a, real quick, I have a customer, for instance, that they're a big organic vegetable grower and their, their food safety testing is very strenuous. Um, every row gets a lot. Um, I just toured his farm last week and it was explaining to me in detail uh, when any of these uh, pathogens are discovered, the whole thing is destroyed. And oftentimes they do that by turning the soil over and exposing those pathogens to UV rays. Um, and so my question to you was, and on your particular farm from a no-till philosophy um, involving food safety circumstances, if you did 
come across any of these positive tests in your crops, what was your strategy to destroy them um, without disturbing the soil? I don't know. That's going a, a lot farther down the road than we have been so far. Um, our crops on these three farms are not subject to that kind of testing right now. Um, but um, as far as like the inputs that you're using, like compost, the quality of compost is extremely important. And the, 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 the maturity of the compost is very important. And I, I, so you, you would want to be using really high quality compost that's well matured, and it should be pathogen tested. So uh, y y your compost can be demonstrated to be pathogen free when you put it in the system. Now, however, your crop may have gotten contaminated uh, with a pathogen. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, how you would destroy it to the satisfaction of a buyer that's totally, you know, sensitive and freaked out about, uh, you know, food safety, I don't know. But what I do know is that a lot of the responses to food safety that we have out there right now in the buying and the retail community, they're not really based on sound science. They're based on hysteria to a certain amount, to a certain extent. And so if you follow the kind of science that Joji and I and Eric have been referring to in our presentations, you read some of this work that's going on, I would hope that buyers and retailers would be reading and, and following this research because you know, science is telling us that <laughs> cover crops and compost make safer environments to grow our food in than uh, an, an, a sterility paradigm, which is what kind of people are basing so-called food safety on right now. The world is a very complex world, and, uh, and, and we have to go with complexity and, and not be afraid and go with sterility. So that, that's a dynamic that's going on right now, and uh, I suggest looking at the science, and I see Eric has something to say about it. I'm going to stay away from the food safety issue, but uh, I will mention that this, this question of whether or not you could do, say, no-till with uh, spinach, three or four crops a year, there's no way. You know, uh, no-till has not been very successfully uh, adopted anywhere in California that I know of. And I think the only opportunities or the, maybe the lowest hanging fruit where it might work is that transition, you know, reduced till, not no-till, but to transition from your vegetable to your cover crop. But if you are going from a cover crop to a vegetable and trying to do no-till, it's more likely to potentially succeed for a crop like, you know, the watermelon that Tom and I, uh, this project that we're working on with Phil Foster and the others. So transplanted crops, you know, watermelons, transplanted broccoli, uh, perhaps transplanted lettuce, uh, tomatoes maybe, things like that, there's more potential. But if it's a direct seeded crop, you know, spinach, you're seeding millions of seed per acre. There's no way that you're gonna get a good stand and be able to do a baby mix, you know, that's, you know, this tall when you cut it uh, with no till. They're, the harvesters are automated and they, they can't handle picking up organic matter, you know, that's sticking up in the in that stand of spinach. So, um, although there's a lot of hype about no-till, just keep, I, I would take it with a real big grain of salt because uh, the reality for California vegetables is that um, we're not there yet. There are ways we can reduce tillage, but no-till, uh, no way, it's not right now. There's, I don't see any way at this point. So we're trying, but it's not easy. <laughs> Yeah, we're just playing on the edges of this thing. We don't have a bunch of systems developed, and we've been working very limited crops. And we're very reliant on strip tilling, which I had a slide of in there, okay? Um, we actually took a step too far with our second watermelon trial because we did a strip till in the first one in 2020, and everything worked very well. And so uh, Phil had done in another field uh, a little, a couple of rows of transplanting into a t completely no-till system, where we didn't, we didn't do the strip, and uh, everything worked well. So on our replicated trial, we said, okay, let's let's take the plunge, let's do no-till, and we left the the tillage strip out of the area that we transplanted the the watermelon in. Well, um, you know, 
after a week or so, our transplants in the no-till plastic culture started disappearing, and we found out that there were earwigs going to crazy under there, and actually wiped out about 90% of that stand. That had to be replanted three weeks later, and so we do have an offset on our yield, you know, timing in that, in that trial. So we learned uh, probably how dependent we are on the strip till, and uh, I don't see that aspect of our work uh, disappearing very soon. So, you know, we, you have to say no till and reduce till is what we're working at. And so far, we're making some success in the reduce till. But uh, as far as a complete no till, yeah, Eric is correct. However, you probably did see that wild slide that I had in there of an of a onion field with all of that heavy residue on the top. That wasn't us, guys. That's down in Brazil. And that was direct seeded, Eric. And because um, I, I have pictures of it as just emerging through that, all that stuff. It's awesome. Now, how do those guys do that? I don't know. But those people down there, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, Uruguay, those guys are like 30 years ahead of us on no-till. And uh, we need to go down there and learn more from them. Um, but they're doing some awesome things like that. We're just barely taking some baby steps in that direction. Hi, yeah, it's uh, Matt Brewer, Inca Gold Farms. You, we're, we actually work in down in Peru, so we're kind of in the same area. Um, but we're working with perennial crops. And so my question for you all, everything that we're talking about now is very much based on annual crops and, um, you know, row crops and such. What type of suggestions do you all have, uh, especially for kind of desert ecosystem, as in no, uh, no biomass at all in our soils and whatnot, uh, for integrating some of these concepts into perennial systems for, let's say, avocado, um, also asparagus, things like that. Do you all have any kind of ideas of uh, specific applications of some of these that we could be using for trying to up our carbon and carbon storage in the soil and also water retention capacity? That's a tough question. I don't. Uh, Tom or Joe, you go for it. <laughs> well, yeah, um, my knowledge about the uh, perennial crop production is very limited. So, um, but one thing about I I read about the uh, um, climate change effect on uh, like a desert area is actually uh, desert uh, temperature may be uh, much more mild um, due to warming uh, and then. But the water things are different. So, yeah, sorry, I don't have any answers. Eric? I'm going to hold off. I, I worked in tree crops, but I have not worked in tree crops with, uh, with in arid environments. So I, I don't want to stick my. So what, we're talking about cover crops and permanent plantings. Well, it's way hell of a lot easier than it is in vegetables or row crops. And, you know, if you go back 50 years, I mean, when I first started uh, getting into agriculture in the Central Valley in uh, about early, early 1970s, I mean, all the vineyards had cover crops, um, at least every other row. And uh, every other avenue was cover cropped. The, the empty avenue was kept for putting the canes uh, when they were uh, pruned and then grinding them. And then the next year, the other middle would have the cover crop. And they were still French plowing in, in those days. I mean, uh, if you just go back, you know, 50 years and look at what was being done in the crops that you're growing, you're probably going to find that cover crops and not necessarily compost, but manure was being applied. And so it's just a lot easier. And the food safety thing is way easier, too, because your harvested product is never touching the ground. And so uh, I wish, you know, yeah, if I'd have been in, <laughs> it's, it's just so much easier in uh, perennial crops. And so I, I know you can get resources and, and uh, to, to help with that, yeah. Hi, 
Hi, uh, my name is Alda Pija, I'm extension specialist at UC Davis, and I just make a comment regarding the food safety. Although we don't have experience on no tillage, but we're doing a, a four-year uh, trial at UC in the same plots as uh, Kate Scal, and um, we found we are doing cover crops, grazing with sheep, plants, tomatoes, and overall we found very low pathogens in the soil, and then no transfer to the to the vegetables. Uh, no experience with no till, but that's gets you know very promising news. A very rare finding pathogens. Um, Tom mentioned that some of the farms they they integrate sheep. Um, it's common practice in Cape Bay. How do you see that being more uh, adopted in general by the organic? What's the challenge or the advantage to be adopted by other organic producers in California? You're asking what are the food safety challenges of employing? If, if you see that's been adopted largely by other farmers here in California, integration of sheep and cover crops in, in organic systems. What's the opportunity? Yes. Well, this whole soil health no-till movement, the way it's developing in the Midwest is that they kind of discovered that, um, you know, they were farming the buffalo commons and that, uh, that, you know, grazing of ruminants was a big part of the evolution of the high quality of their soils. And that in order to achieve the greatest functionality of the soils, um, that they had to reintroduce that grazing as a rotation. So that's kind of become one of the commandments, you know, from Mount Sinai on soil health. That's very difficult to do in vegetable systems, much more difficult to do in vegetable systems. And then when you're talking about food safety, you really get people freaking out on that. Uh, however, um, two of our farms are doing it and they're uh, obtaining food safety certificates. And I'll have to say that Full Belly, who has their own uh, band of sheep and has been doing it for, gosh, I don't know, 12, 15, 20 years, they actually have uh, the best soil uh, organic matter numbers of any of the farms. Um, and there's something very dynamic about the manure and the urine from ruminants that creates some kind of synergy in the soil with the microbiological community that um, enhances the, uh, the fate of carbon to, to, to hang around in the system a lot longer. We don't understand exactly what it is, but it's very dynamic, and that's why it's become part of the uh, the soil health mantra. And um, yeah, and it's, but however, you know, we do have rules. Uh, I think it's 90 days that you have to have quit the uh, animal impact on the ground. Uh, either before the establishment of the next crop, or it's before the harvest of the next crop. Which is it, Gina? Harvest or establishment? I think, yeah, between, you know, 90 days after you get the animals off of there, you cannot harvest a, uh, a product that touches the ground. So uh, Full Belly does that. Um, Scott Park doesn't have to worry about it too much because all his crops go into processing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's, it, it, it's a goal that, that people should be looking at and, yeah. and Working Thank you. Yeah, we, d we did look at the pathogens over 90 days and 120 after pulling the sheep, and we haven't found any pathogens in several trials. Is that a question? No, it was just a comment. Oh, okay. You speak a lot about about compost, and we've used a lot of compost over the years. But there's some negatives about compost, too. How do you mitigate the salt problems that you get by uh, adding compost? And how do you increase your soil diversity with microbes and still have those problems with your organic compost? What mitigates the NaCl and the magnesium and the different things that we tend to see increase 
and then potentially down the line, we're going to have to deal with this. What do we do with the NaCl and the, and the magnesiums in our soil when we're starting to build those up? Yes, we're getting some more organic matter, or is there a time when these microorganisms can reverse that or at least take it into effect? And probably the biggest question I've always had being in organics the last 25 years or 30 years, how can I get the maximum amount of, or, of organisms, the right organisms and the right amount in the soil to get maximum production? And I know you guys are all experts, so you all have that answer. Oh, yeah, it's easy peasy. Um, yeah, as far as the salt, I think the compost that you're going to find the most salts in is from animal manures. Um, if you want to reduce salts, I think you want to go to, uh, you know, green waste or green manure compost more. Um, if you want to reduce the, the need for the total amount of compost that you put in the soil, you grow your own carbon with carbon crop with a with a cover crop. You don't need the carbon from the compost. You need the microbiological inoculation. So, what we did over years, uh, we were using um, strictly manure compost for quite a while. And uh, the gentleman that was selling it to me, Ralph Jurgens, who is a, an agronomist, he eventually told me, "Hey, you're using too much of my compost because my phosphorus was going crazy." Uh, if you use too much animal manure compost, not only are you going to run into some salt issues, I think even a greater issue is your phosphorus is going to get overwhelmingly high. So we backed off. We were using, you know, roughly 10 tons of compost uh, per cropping cycle. So we went to eight tons of green waste compost and just a ton and a half of the, 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 the dairy waste compost just as an inoculum. Um, so there's different ways of dealing with that. I found that our salts would get out of hand if we had a couple of low, uh, below normal rainfall years in a row. Uh, my sodium would start creeping up. We were always trying to keep it uh, below 2% of cation exchange capacity. If I had a couple of half dry years in a row, it would start creeping up to three um, or past three. Um, so you need more rainfall. You're always in irrigated systems and semi-arid climates. You always need good soil leaching from winter rains. If you don't get it, you got to make up with it for sprinklers or you just have to suck it up. Uh, what Ralph told me also, my agronomist, was that if you have a lot of, uh, you know, robust biology in the soil, it will buffer uh, those kinds of things and make, uh, make them less damaging to your plants. But you do want to control your... Um, your sodium for sure. Um, so there's different ways of manipulating it as far as how you know that you have the perfect balance of microbes in your soil. You know, you can spend a lot of money on genomic testing. You can get a, a massive amount of numbers and everything, but then try to find somebody that can interpret it for you and tell you what the hell it means. We're not there yet. We're going to get there, but we're not there yet. So you can play with that if you want, but um, other than that, Watch your crops, you know, uh, stick your hand in your soil, smell it out. You know, I mean, your crop is a bioassay. If your crops are going well, then you're probably doing the right thing. But, uh, you know, testing is important as well. Uh, just a general comment. I would be very cautious with using any of these um, molecular tests to, to check for the different microbes in the soil. I haven't seen a lot of data that shows that those are going to provide much, much benefit to farmers. So I wouldn't. I'd be very cautious with that stuff. You know, if somebody says, you know, I'm going to do a test and t check your microbes, Sarah, you know, show me some really good data. And I'm not saying a data from a company. I'm saying data from a published study that was done by somebody who is not biased, you know, towards that product and show, show me that there was a benefit. I haven't seen a lot of that. So be cautious with that. I don't like to see growers wasting money. Uh, regarding um, compost versus cover crops, um, Compost is very different. There's a lot of different types of compost, like Tom mentioned, yard waste compost, the green waste type, the manure types. Um, in our long-term study in Salinas, which we're now in our 18th year of, we found that organic matter added from compost, yard waste compost, does not have near the beneficial effect on soil health, which we measured using microbial biomass, that a cover crop had. 
So a cover crop is adding a different type of organic matter to the soil than compost adds. So you might want to go check out a video that I made on this. It's, um, I think the title is something about lessons from long-term research. And I talk a little bit about some of the, the soil health uh, information that came from a cover crop versus from a compost. It kind of didn't matter what the cover crop was. You know, if it's rye or if it's a legume cereal mixture or mustard, all of those were good. Um, so anyway, that's just a, a few thoughts on that issue. Uh, real quick. So the reason that cover crops that I didn't learn until it was too late, uh, you know, enhance the microbi microbiological diversity and biomass greater is that, you know, as much as 30% of the photosynthetic product of a plant is actually going through the roots and feeding microbes in the soil, uh, recruiting allies. And so when you're uh, just adding compost, you're not doing that part of it. Um, they go hand in hand, uh, both of them, but uh, don't forget that roots are constantly feeding goodies to their microbial allies in the soil. Thanks, Tom. All right, well, that concludes the speaker portion, so I just want to give a quick round of applause to our speakers, near and far. <laughs> All right, so Bob, can you switch it? Thank you. Okay, so this, for the next 20 minutes, um, actually 15 minutes of movement, um, we're gonna get you up from your seats and there are flip charts around the room um, about different topics in agriculture that we're gonna have you move to and have discussions for about 15 minutes. Um, so what you guys are gonna be talking about or what are the top challenges you're currently facing within that topic area? What is the research, extension, educational needs, opportunities that you see for that topic area? So um, some, of, some of our speakers and a couple of our staff are gonna be leading these groups, but there'll be a couple of them that need a note taker or a leader. So if you can just designate someone, that would be great. They're sticky on the back, so if you are taking a lot of notes, ch chunk one off, stick it on the wall, and start anew. Um, so we're hoping that we can have about even groupings. So we have um, seed and plant breeding here, animal production and integration up there, soil health management, economic markets and challenges, climate change, it's just an easy topic over here, um, and pest disease and weeds. I know these are big topics, but our hope is that you guys can meet one another and chat and sort of get up out of your seats for a little while, take some notes. This is really important for us as an organization. This is the way that we learn from our community. Um, obviously, we do our national um, research service, uh, excuse me, survey every few years, but it's really important to get this qualitative data. So. What you're writing down is actually very important for us in the, the way that we decide how we do our work. So if everyone can get up, go to your uh, corners, choose a corner for about 15 minutes, and then we'll do a report back at the end. Thank you. All right, we're going to do a quick debrief. We just want to hear um, one top challenge or maybe the most significant need that you have within that category. Um, so if we could just have one person from each group, I know mostly we have interest in the soil health group in the back and the insect and pest and weed group as well as climate change over here. So, all right, if we could have just one representative from each group come up here real quick, come up to the front of the room and just bring one significant need or challenge that you have that you guys talked about in your group today to share with everyone else. All right, Breeze is going to start us off coming from the seed and plant breeding conversation. It's great. I think everybody is so excited to network and share with each other. So we can keep this as short and informal as folks want. But I was at the um, seed and plant breeding group. Uh, we are a pretty small group, but had some great conversation and cover crop varieties was sort of the topic of conversation. Anybody else can just come on up and popcorn share anything they talked about. Can we get one person from the insect pest breeding or uh, insect pest disease category? And one person from soil health, one person from climate change. Can you please come on up? Don't be scared. It's okay. Hey. Go Matt. Um, I don't know if I can give you one because it's, 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 it's pretty uh, contextual. Uh, but from the pest management group, um, diamondback moth, western flower thrips, um, especially in relation to iron. Um, INV, or S, INSV, sorry. Um, those are issues we talked about quite a bit. 
um, also nematode management, and uh, better understanding of microbial interactions with pests. Great, thank you, yeah. Matt. All right, someone from the climate change group, please come on up. And soil health, if you want to send someone down to be uh, next up on base. Hello, my name is Brandon. Uh, at the climate change group, we mainly discussed a lot of points, but the overarching consideration was we need more research funded, more rigorous life cycle analysis on practices versus products. And so there's a lot of different issues that came out, but we generally need more research funded by reputable organizations on practices. So we hope the Organic Research Foundation can work on that. And one person from Soil Health Management. Can you send someone down, please? So we talked about the challenges of. Nice and close to the mic. So we talked about the challenges of building soil health and the management practices that go along with it. So um, challenges of soil compaction with, um, well, with the harvest rigs in carrots, double trailers, celery. So you have compaction issues. So if you want to go in with minimum till, it's hard to follow up with a uh, when you've got harvesters that are really heavy and compacting the soil. So you have to be thoughtful about um, minimum till or no till when you have heavy equipment in your soil. So that's where maybe thoughtful tillage comes in and you rip the ground and, and open it up and then start implementing um, minimum till. Um, and then just maintaining economic viability in um, intensive vegetable systems where we've got to get back two or three times within a um, cropping season, in, in a one-year season. So if you're practicing um, minimum till or no till to try to create soil health by keeping roots in the ground, how can you do that and maintain economic viability? So there is where maybe equipment modification comes in and you try to um, take some of your bigger tractors that are working the soil with disc and, and um, uh, mulchers and modifying that equipment to do more strip tillage and um, keeping roots in the ground, but then strip tilling where you're going to be transplanting broccoli, cauliflower, um, romaine. But then if you do have spinach, maybe you um, uh, bury your residue with a like a modified reverse mulcher where you're not coming in and disking and disking and then mulching, you just go in and do one reverse mulch. And then um, measuring soil health. So, you know, what are the measurements that we want to look at? What are the measurements that auditing companies are going to be wanting to look at? So that's still up in the open. The Soil Health Institute really hasn't come down and said, these are the measurements that we want. But, you know, you think about um, organic matter, uh, just about 50% of organic matter is carbon. So that's a good way to measure your carbon input. Um, Water infiltration, water holding capacity, that all goes hand in hand with good soil health. And then um, maybe microbial biomass, there are different labs out there that are measuring that, and then your chemistry analysis. So those are some so of the challenges. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, awesome. Thank you all so much. Again, thank you to our speakers. Um, please take the survey on your seat and just leave it there. You can fill out as much information as you want. Um, I'll just say please sign up also for our newsletter and be in touch. You know, we're a nonprofit organization and we fundraise for every dollar. So this community is what allows us to do this work. Um, and some of our supporters are in the room today and we're just extremely grateful to this community that allows us to keep funding research and making sure that the education is out there for you guys to use. So I'll be around the next couple of days. Um, come find me or shoot me an email at Haley at OFRF.org and have a great OGS. Thanks so much.